Hi there, welcome. This is Bante van Rakita, also known as Brother Ben. Today we're going to be continuing with the Buddha's technique and practice of counseling as depicted in the Pali Canon by the excellent Jenny Quick. So this work was her thesis submitted to the Department of Philosophy, University of Kalania, Sri Lanka, to the degree of Doctor of Philosophy, published in 2007. So I do include permission from the author, Jenny Quick, to use this material for teaching purposes. A disclaimer, I'm not claiming to be a highly qualified mental health professional, a licensed counsellor. I do have a diploma in Buddhist psychotherapy and counselling, obtained in Singapore. I also have experience of approximately 7,000 meditation interviews. I've also traveled across around 160 Buddhist temples across Asia. I currently have 11 years of training as a Buddhist seminar. So today we're going to be continuing from page 36 on the subject of counseling the dying. Counseling the dying at the deathbed also has a doctrinal basis. Among the classifications of karma or retributive actions, there is a classification that is according to the priority of effect, namely 1. Weighty, Garuka karma, 2. Habitual, Archina or Yabahula karma, 3. Death proximate, Asana karma, and four stored up, Katata karma. Accordingly, if the first two retributive actions are not available, the third, death proximate karma, which is the wholesome or unwholesome volitional act done, the karma, just before death comes into prominence or else a sign of the karma, the karma nimitta, or a sign of future existence, jati nimitta. In this way, the relinking consciousness, patisandhi vijnana, of the dying person is determined by the death proximate, volitional act he has performed. Because of this reason, counselling at the deathbed can help make the last thought moment wholesome, so that the dying person should have a good rebirth. Once the Buddha visited a sick ward in Vasali and counselled a monk who was at the last stage of his life and helped him face his end collected and composed as his bodily endurance has come to its limit from the Anguttara Nikaya Book of Threes, page 142. When the treasurer, Anatta Pindika, was severely ill, Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Ananda counseled him together to alleviate his distress and despair caused by physical pain. Sangnuta Nikaya, 5th book, page 383. The Buddhist counsellor aims at helping the dying to experience a so-called lucky death, Bhadakang Maranang, as Venerable Sariputta has shown from Anguttara Nikaya, Book of Threes, page 292. Once, Venerable Ananda counselled the treasurer to get rid of terror, trembling and fear of death and be self-reliant and firm at the face of death. In the Anatta Pindiko Vada Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya 3, page 258. When Venerable Sariputta counselled the treasurer, who was sinking fast, to look at every sense data objectively, he was happy shed tears of joy, and passed away silently, and was born in Tusita heaven. That's from Anguttara Nikaya, Book of Threes, page 294. Sarakani, an alcoholic, gave up his drinking and turned over a new leaf in his old age. He purged his mind from obsessions, adhered to good moral behaviour, and became a follower of the Buddha. He, at the last days of his life, realized the stream-winning stage and was born in heaven. 
There is an incident revealing how a Buddhist devotee was relieved from his depression at the time of his death by his Buddhist wife. Sentiments expressed by the wife show how she prepared the husband to face death with understanding. She said, My good householder, you should not die fretfully. Sorrowful is the death of the fretful. The death which is fretful has been decried by the Buddha. Maybe you think, alas, when I am gone, my good wife will not be able to support the children, nor keep the household together. Or maybe you think, alas, when I am gone, my good wife will go to another. Or maybe you think, alas, when I am gone, my good wife will not keep the virtues in full. Or maybe you think, alas, when I am gone, my good wife will not gain the calm of heart. Or maybe you think, alas, when I am gone, my good wife will not win confidence with the teacher's word. That's from Sangnita Nikaya 5, page 408. She took those concerns that could have been disturbing his mind, addressed them one by one to appease his depression and prepared him for his last journey. Venerable Sariputta visited his old friend, Dhananjani, who was on his deathbed and through gradual discussion guided him to be born in the Brahma world. When the Buddha was told of this incident, the Buddha reprimanded him, saying, Sariputta, having established the Brahmin, Dhananjani, in the inferior Brahma world, why did you rise from your seat and leave while still more to be done? Venerable sir, said Sariputta, I thought thus, these Brahmins are devoted to the Brahma world. Suppose I show the Brahmin, Dhananjani, the path to the company of Brahma. The Buddha replied, Sariputta, the Brahmin Dhananjani has died and has reappeared in the Brahma world. From the Dhananjani Sutta, Majjhimanakaya 2, page 195-196. Chapter 1. Early Buddhism and Counselling. Rejoice, Tissa, rejoice. I am here to counsel. I am here to assist. I am here to instruct. Apirama Tissa, Apirama Tissa, Ahang Ovadena, Ahang Anugahena, Ahang Anusa Saniati. Sangnita 3, page 109. According to the British Association of Counseling, the aim and objective of counselling is to provide the opportunity for those who wish to work towards living in a more satisfying and resourceful way concerning the following. Developmental issues. Addressing, resolving specific problems. Making decisions. Coping with crises. Developing personal insight and knowledge. Working through feelings of inner conflict. Improving relationships with others. The word counselling is derived from Latin consilium and means consultation or advice. According to Cambridge Dictionary, counselling is to give advice, especially on social and personal problems. Oxford Dictionary gives a much more comprehensive definition saying that it is to give professional help and advice to someone to resolve personal, social or psychological problems. The Collins Co-Build Dictionary gives the meaning as advice which a therapist or other expert gives to someone about a particular problem. The contributions made by modern psychologists to the development of psychotherapy and counselling, contrary to giving mere advice, have expanded the scope of counselling, embracing numerous aspects of life and all age groups. Hence, it is now considered 
as a specialized discipline, dealing with many facets of day-to-day -day life. It covers areas such as family, marriage, sex, education, vocation, employment, unemployment, alcoholism, frustration, stress, depression, and mental and emotional problems, as well as physical problems, such as pain management. Significantly, modern psychotherapists believe strongly that every individual has the capability to make decisions that are conducive to one's own welfare and put those decisions into practice effectively by themselves. Carl Rogers, the American psychologist, is of the opinion that every individual has the ability to steer his life and also has a right to hold his own view as to how he should manage his life. The counsellor's task is to help him see and clear the path, as it were. What is needed is simply to empower them so that they become aware of their capability, which was termed in Buddhist as arouse awareness or attention. Satupada karaniya. In fact, this is the autonomy of judgment illustrated by the Buddha to Kalamas in the famous Kalama Sutta. When the Kalamas are bewildered and puzzled, listening to divergent, eloquent speeches, the Buddha empowers them to clear their doubts and to arrive at a decision by themselves. Without being sentimental, emotional or partial, one has to evaluate the facts in relation to one's welfare and others' welfare in terms of the nature and the inherent characteristic features of a given emotion. The note there from Kaka Chupama Sutta, Majjhimikaya 1, page 124. The Buddha's approach fulfills all the above requirements and descriptions of counseling and can be verified conveniently with the life and teachings of the Buddha found in Pali canonical scriptures. Counseling per se is within the ideological framework of the Buddha's teachings. If we use modern terminology, the entire teachings of the Buddha is psychological as well as psychoanalytical, aiming at psychotherapy through counseling. With the historic address to five fellow ascetics, the Buddha commenced his mission of counseling, which he continued until the last moment of his mortal existence. Certainly the first discourse delivered by the Buddha can be considered as a successful attempt at rectifying the maladjusted mindset of the five ascetics who had resorted to asceticism with the firm conviction of realizing the goal by means of self-mortification. The main concern of the Buddha's mission was the emotional, psychological and physical suffering of sentient beings and how to overcome them. The Buddha addressed a monk called Anuradha and dispelled his misconception related to metaphysical questions by stressing the fact that both formally and then he was proclaiming just suffering and the cessation of suffering. The note from Sangnuta Nikaya 4, page 377, Majima 1, page 140, Pube Chahang Anuradha, Etarahi cha dukanjeva, panya pemi dukasa cha nerodang. The fact is more explicitly stated in another context where a monk called Malunkya Putta wanted to know the answers to metaphysical questions from the Buddha. The Buddha explained to him what he has declared This is suffering, this is the origin of suffering. This is the cessation of suffering. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. Why I have declared that? Because it is beneficial. It belongs to the fundamentals of holy life. It leads to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, 
to Nibbana. That is why I have declared it. In appreciation of the Buddhist psychological standpoint, some of the leading psychologists of our time recognized the richness and depth of the psychological content found in Buddha's teachings and expressed their appreciation of it without any religious bias or prejudice. It is interesting to note in this connection how Carl Gustav Jung, 1845 to 1910, has remarked unreservedly why he was attracted to Buddhism. He said, My task was the treatment of psychic suffering, and it was that that impelled me to become acquainted with the views and methods of that great teacher of humanity, whose principal theme was the chain of suffering, old age, sickness, and death. Continuing further, he said, there may be some afflictions which seem unendurable and require treatment just as much as a direct illness. They call for a kind of moral attitude, such as is provided by religious faith, or a philosophical belief. In this respect, the study of Buddhist literature was of great help to me, since it trains one to observe suffering objectively, and to take a universal view of the causes. The note there from the book, Psychology and the East, page 209, by Carl Jung. The objective evaluation of body, mind, feeling, mind objects, including emotions, has been introduced as a technique of mind culture in the teaching of the four bases of mindfulness in Buddhism. At the beginning of the discourse on four bases of mindfulness, it is stated that it is the sure path. It is for the one purification of beings, satanang visudhya, two overcoming of sorrow, three overcoming of lamentation, Soka Paridevana. Four, destruction of physical suffering. Five, destruction of mental suffering. Dukkha Domanasana Atangamaya. Six, reaching the right realization. Nyayasa Adigamaya. Seven, Attainment of Nibbana, Nibbanasa Satchikiriyaya. Out of the seven benefits outlined here, five are related to our daily life. Maha Satipatthana Sutta, Majima 2, page 290-318. Robert H. Thules, the Cambridge psychologist, has said in relation to Buddhist approach, to the subject of psychotherapy is also worthwhile considering in this context. He remarked, I think that primitive Buddhism must be understood as a system of psychotherapy. Acceptance of the Christian faith may, of course, also give relief from mental burdens. But this is only incidental, whereas the psychotherapeutic aim of Buddhism is fundamental. This is why I think we can feel much of the teachings of the Buddha as relevant to our needs in a way that would have been impossible to our grandfathers because we have accepted and become used to the aim of psychotherapy. There are, of course, other elements in Buddhism much more alien to our way of thinking, but there is also another element which brings it close to modern way of thinking. This is the fact that it is a system of thought dominated by the idea of cause and effect. From the book, Christianity and Buddhism, page five and six, Robert H. Thules. Thules, who drew our attention to parallelism between the point of view of Freud and that of Buddhism, via conventionalization and assimilation 
in religious movements as problems in social psychology, with special reference to the development of Buddhism and Christianity by Robert H. Thouless, continues to hold the view that Buddhism is psychoanalytical by nature. In his foreword to De Silva's doctorate thesis on Buddhist and Freudian psychology, he stated, I am encouraged to find that my preliminary suggestions seem to have been on right lines, and I am glad to find the matter more fully elucidated by the present work. That note from Buddhist and Freudian Psychology by De Silva Padmasiri in the foreword. William James, 1842 to 1910, the American psychologist who contributed much to the development of the philosophy of pragmatism, is also one of the early psychologists who appreciate Buddhism as a religion pregnant with psychological data. Rick Fields has recorded an interesting incident where he, William James, revealed his unreserved acceptance of Buddhism as psychology. Anagarika Dharmapala of Sri Lanka, in his third visit to America, 1902 to 1904, attended a lecture by Professor William James at Harvard. William James, recognising Dhammapala dressed in his yellow robe and seated in the hall, said, Take my chair. You are better equipped to lecture on psychology than I. Dhammapala took the challenge and gave a talk outlining the major doctrines of Buddhism. After the talk, Professor James turned to his class and announced, this is the psychology everybody will be studying 25 years from now. And that quote comes from How the Swans Came to the Lake, a narrative history of Buddhism in America by Rick Fields, page 134. The Buddha's emphasis on pragmatic use of the doctrine rather than mere theorizing and recitation echoes in the theory of pragmatism postulated by James. He maintained that our intellectual activity, our philosophizing, should have as its purpose the attempt to resolve difficulties that arise in the course of our attempts to deal with experience. That note comes from Essentials of Buddhism, page 175, P. Ven Nyanarama. The Buddha stressed the pragmatic approach to man's present predicament with parables and similes throughout his career. The parable of the Sinsapa leaves in hand. From Samnuta 5, page 370. The parable of the raft. Majjhimanikaya 1, page 134 to 135 and the parable of the poisoned arrow, Majjhimanikaya 1, page 429. See also Dharmapada 183, 276. Are very popular parables among them. This reminds us how the American clinical psychologist, Carl Rogers, also emphasized practice over mere theoretical knowledge. That note from Buddhism, and the Art of Psychotherapy by Hayao Kawaii, page 116. Unlike Upanishadic thought, the Buddhist view of the mind is empiricist and naturalistic in all aspects and devotes a greater part of the doctrine to mind analysis for the sake of mind culture, which includes psychotherapy and counselling. This is a tendency unique to Buddhism that is not found in any of the ancient religions of the world. Sarath Chandra is highly convinced by this approach to psychological analysis 
found in early Buddhist texts and referred to them, delineating the parallelism between Buddhism and modern psychology. He remarks in his doctoral thesis, what is most interesting in the analysis of mind contained in this literature is its empiricist approach and the fact that the approach produced results which are strikingly similar to those produced by modern psychologists using introspective methods. Until recent times, when psychological research came to be done largely in the laboratory, in the history of psychology, therefore, I believe that these are the first speculations putting forward a naturalistic view of mind and the closest in the ancient world to present day psychological theories. That note from the introductory note to Buddhist Psychology of Perception by E. R. Sarath Chandra. Jaya Tileke highlighted the Buddhist psychological standpoint and stressed that according to Buddhism, our conceptual and perceptual activities rest on the physical basis and that mental phenomena are not mere accompaniments of neural or brain phenomena. Since Buddhism provides us with a comprehensive account of human experience and behavior, we are in a position to understand control and develop ourselves by a process of self-analysis to lead a happy life and live in harmony with others. Therefore, referring to the naturalist trend, he says, the nature of the causal relations that hold among mental phenomena and their relations to the body, the physical, social and ideological environment are also analysed and the correlations explained by them. In short, we have the earliest historical account of a naturalistic view of the mind. That note from the book The Buddhist Analysis of Mind in the Message of the Buddha, page 80, by K. N. Jayatileke. Edward Konzer, the Buddhist scholar, well versed in all Buddhist traditions, observes the psychological factor in Buddhism and asserts that Buddhism blends metaphysics and psychology in a way to which there is no parallel in the West. That note from the book Buddhism, Its Essence and Development, page 17, by Edward Konzer. Additional note. Probably he used the word metaphysics in the sense of higher philosophy. He further emphasizes how Buddhist evaluation of the human mind is in conformity with modern philosophical and psychological discoveries. He refutes the view that Buddhism is pessimistic in outlook and maintains that there is a little empty hole in all of us. Quote, the discoveries which philosophers and psychologists have made in recent years about the central importance of anxiety at the very core of our being have quite a Buddhist ring about them. According to the views elaborated by Schiele, Freud, Heidegger and Jaspers, there is in the core of our being a basic anxiety, a little empty hole, from which all other forms of anxiety and unease draw their strength from Buddhism, Its Essence and Development by Edward Konzer. A psychotherapist of our times, Mark Epstein, describes the first noble truth of suffering as humiliation and pervasive unsatisfactoriness. He highlights the fact of suffering and says that above all, the Buddha has asked us to accept the uncertainties that we otherwise try to ignore. Only in so doing, then can we appreciate the rest of Buddha's psychotherapy. 
that note from Thoughts Without a Thinker, page 53, by Mark Epstein. Mind in Early Buddhism The first two stanzas of the Dharmapada illustrate the fundamental position ascribed in Buddhist psychology, as well as in ethics, and state that mind is the forerunner of all mental states. Mind is chief, and mind made are they. Therefore, to emphasize the crucial position of the mind in Buddhism, more explicitly, Venerable Jnanaponika puts it precisely thus. Mind is the starting point, the focal point, and also as the liberated mind of the saint, the culminating point, comes from Dhammapada verses 1 and 2, Mano Pubangama Dhamma, Mano Seta, Mano Maya. Continuing further, he says, It is significant and worth pondering upon that the Bible commences with the words, In the beginning, the God created the heaven and the earth. While the Dhammapada, one of the most beautiful and popular books of the Buddhist scriptures, open mind precedes things, dominates them, creates them. Translation by Bhikkhu Kasapa. These momentous words are the quiet and uncontending but unshakable reply of the Buddha to that biblical belief. Here are the roads of these two religions are part. The one leads far away from an imaginary beyond, the other leads straight home into man's very heart. That quote from The Heart of Buddhist Meditation, page 21, by Venerable Nyanaponika. The all-embracing nature of the mind, and how those who have come under the control of the mind are subjected to total obsession, is illustrated in a stanza in the Sangyutta Nikaya. The world is led around by the mind. By mind it is dragged here and there. Mind is the one thing that has all under its control. That is in Pali from Samyutta 1. Chitena niati loko. Chitena parakasati. Chitasa ekadamasa. Sabeva vasa mamvagu. Page 87, translated by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Early Buddhism distinguishes clearly three fundamental functions of the mind – affective, conative, and cognitive. Feeling is the affective aspect of the mind. Acting, willing, striving, and desiring are the conative aspect. The cognitive aspect includes knowing, believing, reasoning, and perceiving. Just to illustrate, many verbal forms have been coined about the different shades of knowing from the root nya to know. Knows, jhanati, knows with discrimination, vijanati, recognizes, sanjanati, knows with wisdom, pajanati knows comprehensively, parijanati, knows with extrasensory perception, abhijanati, learns or grasps, ajanati, admits or approves, patijanati. And this comes from Essentials of Buddhism, page 115, P. Venyanarama, or Venerable Jnana Rama P. Affective, conative, and cognitive functions of the mind are inseparably interconnected and hence undetectable individually due to simultaneous action and interaction. The mind's active and passive characteristics, which are mentioned in numerous contexts in the Pali Canon, are too many and varied to state here. This note from Encyclopedia of Buddhism, Article on Mind, by W.S. Karunarane. These descriptive analyses 
provide a counsellor multiple viewpoints to review the involved nature of psychological disorders of their counsellees or clients. The Chitta Vaga of the Dharmapada also illustrates the different nature of the mind and how it can be managed, what is suffering. The Pali word Dukkha has been translated to mean suffering. Since the word connotes a wider import in relation to the context in which it is used, scholars have given quite a good number of meanings to it. Among them we see pain, ill, sorrow, insecurity, unpleasantness, anguish, anxiety, unhappiness, conflict, unsatisfactoriness, pervasive unsatisfactoriness, humiliation and stress. A note there, the latter is the latest rendering given by Venerable Tanisero, Geoffrey de Graff, in his writings. The last word, stress, has been borrowed from physics, meaning pressure or tension, exerted on a material object and has a wider connotation referring to the overall effect of the condition on an individual. When a person is stressed, it influences their emotions, physiology, behavior, and cognition. Emotionally, sadness, anger, depression, irritation, and frustration overwhelm him. Physiologically, they experience headaches, stomach ulcers, constipation, backaches, and high blood pressure. Behaviorally, they may exhibit poor concentration, forgetfulness, lethargy, inefficiency, and poor interpersonal skills. Cognitively, they will show signs of helplessness, lack of self-respect, and self-confidence. And they may consider living as meaningless, and may go to the extent of committing suicide. As described in Buddhism, all of these connotations are found in the term dukkha. The words suffering and unsatisfactoriness are often used today to represent the Buddhist concept of dukkha. It is to be noted that the Pali term connotes both physical suffering and mental or psychological suffering. Presumably to a certain extent, while unsatisfactoriness implies the psychological aspect of the concept, suffering implies generally both aspects. It is interesting to note in this connection that the Buddhist concept of dukkha is found in different terms in Western psychology and philosophy as well. It is well known that Soren Kierkegaard, 1813 to 1855, the existentialist philosopher, referred to man's fear that torments him when he is confronted with life's problems and declared that he is constantly in a state of anguish. Immanuel Kant, 1724 to 1804, who made many an original and influential contribution to Western philosophical thought, stated that man is ever in a great predicament. Note 28. From a comparative study of early Buddhism and Kantian philosophy, page 7 and 83, by S. G. M. Weirasinghe. Sigmund Freud, 1856 to 1939, emphasized that humans are always suffering from an uncertainty, a fear expressed in terms of anxiety. The philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, 1788 to 1860, said that willing and striving, which he compared to an unquenchable thirst, are the whole being of the nature of man. The basis of it is need and want, thus followed by pain, from The World as Will and Representation, Volume 1, page 311, by Arthur Schopenhauer. All these assertions remind us of the Buddha's teaching on the first and second noble truths, suffering, and desire the cause of suffering. The Western critics who refused to accept the concrete reality propounded by him branded Schopenhauer's philosophy as black pessimism.
They leveled the same accusation against Buddhism, asserting that Buddhism is life-negating and pessimistic. Many of those critics could not see or refuse to see that Buddhism not only analyzes suffering, but most importantly, also prescribes an antidote to it. It has been shown by many writers that the Buddha's teachings are neither a doctrine of pessimism nor an optimism of a fool's paradise. It is a realism which teaches us to understand things as they really are. Yata, Buddha, Jnana, Dasana, from The Buddha's Ancient Path, page 92 and 168, from Venerable Piyar Dasi. There are some critics who viewed Buddhism just as they would view their enemies. For instance, the rationality of Monia Williams runs wild when he embarked on a malicious attack of the Buddha and his teachings in a lengthy criticism of Buddhism. This famous Indologist says, Christianity is a religion, whereas Buddhism, at least in its earliest and truest form, is not a religion at all, but a mere system of morality and philosophy founded on a pessimistic theory of life. Buddhism, page 537, uh, New Delhi, 1995, first published in 1889, written by M. Williams, sorry, Monia M. Williams, and a note underneath. He is very disturbed that the Buddha is called Light of Asia and adduces arguments to repudiate the claim. Referring to the Buddhist monastic discipline, he expresses his contempt strongly saying, all those significant precepts and prohibitions in its books of discipline, which indeed no Christian could soil his lips uttering. Thaulis, however, noticed the difference between the Christian concept of sin and the Buddhist concept of sorrow, and remarked that since the Buddha teaches the necessity of detachment from what the modern psychologists call ego involvement. The Buddha's analysis of sorrow is a different approach. That note from Christianity and Buddhism, page two and three, Robert H. Thaulis. As accurately noted by eminent psychologists and psychotherapists, canonical Pali scriptures portray the salient features of the Buddha as an ideal counselor who devoted his time and aptitude to counseling men and women of different social status. To some extent, later tradition substantiates the issue further by providing more details preserved in the early Buddhist scholastic tradition. For 45 years after his enlightenment, the Buddha never tired of counseling those who sought his assistance in times of need. The clients who went to the Buddha seeking help had been confronted with different kinds of problems. Some suffered from stress or depression, others from traumatic experiences, and yet others sought assistance to achieve their goals. Psychoanalysis, psychotherapy and counselling. Modern methods of psychoanalysis, psychotherapy and counselling are comparatively new disciplines developed from psychology. Sigmund Freud, 1856-1939, is honoured as the founder of psychoanalysis, which is a psychological theory and therapy aiming to treat mental disorders by investigating the interaction of conscious and unconscious elements in the mind and bringing repressed fears and conflicts to the conscious mind. The main techniques used are free association and the recall of dreams. And usually it requires approximately 50 weekly sessions for up to three years. In the course of the sessions, the client's past experiences and relationships are transferred to the psychoanalyst for resolution. With reference to modern psychoanalytical trend, Francis Story remarks, one defect of psychoanalysis 
as it is practiced in the West, is that it often reveals ugly aspects of the personality before the patient is ready to accept them. This sometimes has undesirable side effects and may even cause disintegration of personality. That note from Dimensions of Buddhist Thought, page 351, by Francis Story. Psychotherapy is a method of treatment for mental disorders by psychological rather than medical means. In the client-centered, the therapist refrains from giving any direct advice to the client. The client is encouraged to choose and explore the issues that they want to work on, and the psychotherapist assists the client by helping and guiding him to resolve their own issues. Counseling as a profession evolved in recent times. Among several implications of the word and the professions related to it, we are concerned with the meaning of giving professional help and advice to resolve personal, social, emotional or psychological problems of clients. Evidently, in addition to the references to counselling, the Pali canonical texts abound in materials related to psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. The field of counselling. Counsellors and psychotherapists hold different opinions with regard to the perimeter of each field. According to Thorne, counselling is for less disturbed people dealing with conscious problems and requiring a single issue focus, while psychotherapy is for more disturbed people who exhibit less apparent constellations of problems. That note from Psychotherapy and Counselling, The Quest for Difference, page 244 to 248 by B. Thorne. Shipton and Smith think that this definition allows us to consider the possibility that counselling often leads to psychotherapy and that the job title of the practitioner does not necessarily describe the work done. A counsellor may practice psychotherapy at times and psychotherapists may sometimes be counselling. That note from Long Term Counselling, page 20, Geraldine Shipton, and Eileen Smith. They further show how Carl Rogers constantly used the terms counselling and psychotherapy interchangeably in page 21 of the same book. Since counselling is also a therapy, it seems that its boundary is difficult to determine strictly. Apparently, more often than not, these terms have been used interchangeably by mental health therapists in their writing. In our study, while paying attention to these interpretations, we adhere to the popular usage of the term. It is more real than apparent that Buddhism abounds in data pertaining to psychology, psychoanalysis and psychotherapy, as well as counselling. Seymour Borstein in Buddhism in Psychotherapy suggests an extra constructive dimension which can be used for psychotherapy since it is relevant to Buddhist counselling as well, our attention can be drawn to it. The author says, an extra constructive dimension may be added to traditional psychotherapy by incorporating a transpersonal approach. This could involve sharing with one's clients some of the therapist's philosophic beliefs via use of teaching stories. That note from Buddhism in Psychotherapy, page 2, Wheel Numbers 290-291, to 291, BPS Candy Sri Lanka, by Borstein, Seymour, and Diatharaj G. Olaf. Frame also discusses the importance of transpersonal approach in psychotherapy and quotes a number of psychotherapists who favoured it. What she has said, while enumerating its importance, can be summarised thus. It is an approach to healing and growth that addresses multiple levels of the spectrum of identity, pre-personal, personal and transpersonal. It recognises the therapist's unfolding awareness of the self and his or her 
spiritual worldview as central in shaping the nature, process and outcome of therapy. It is a process of awakening from a lesser to a greater identity. It facilitates the process of awakening by making use of techniques that enhance intuition and deepen awareness of personal and transpersonal realms of the psyche from Marsha Wiggins' frame, Integrating Religion and Spirituality into Counseling, page four to five. Original Pali texts are filled counsels based on the Buddha's personal experience the Buddha used effectively. His method of counseling is transpersonal and he addresses clients directly through personal experiences and conviction. Meditation techniques described under concentration meditation and insight meditation integrate emotionality and spirituality for one's wellness. In this regard, one basic factor can be cited. Here we see how the Buddha addresses the monks out of personal experience. In this particular instance, the Buddha addressing the monks in connection with a monk called Molya Paguna, who refused to listen to any advice. Monks, I eat at a single session. By so doing, I am free from illness and affliction, and I enjoy health, strength, and a comfortable abiding. Come, monks, eat at a single session. By so doing, you will be free from illness and affliction, and you will enjoy health, strength, and a comfortable abiding. That note from Kakachu Pamasutta, Majjhima Nikaya 1, page 122. The place of religion and spirituality in counselling. Earlier generations of psychotherapists had a negative attitude towards religion and spirituality. The involvement of spirituality or religion in psychotherapy was considered either useless or harmful to the psychotherapeutic practice. They had some substantial reasons to maintain this proclivity throughout their therapeutic career. Until the 18th century, Europe was undergoing several adverse effects of religious monopoly of the church. The setting up of the Inquisition by Pope Gregory IX in 1231 AD to fight against heresies and moral offences is one of the tragedies of European history. The use of torture on offenders was sanctioned as early as 1252 AD. Other Catholic countries in Europe soon followed the example by setting up inquisitions. After a lapse of some time, Spain revived it in the 15th century. This religious tribunal, infamous for its cruelty, had the legal authority not only to torture, but also to fine, imprison, or execute the offenders by burning them on a stake. While the hysteria of torturing and massacring free thinkers and scientists went on, there appeared the Renaissance or the revival of classical learning in Italy in the 14th century. But then it soon followed the mania of witch hunting. That note, the witch hunting was justified on the biblical injunction, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, from Exodus 22.18. In Europe and in America, thousands of so-called witches were hunted and executed without any fair trial. Trial was so constituted that the accused had no opportunity to prove their innocence. With the dawn of enlightenment, or the age of reason, in the 18th century, there was the emphasis on free, rational and scientific inquiry against the authoritarian ways of imposing beliefs on the people. During the period of enlightenment, thinkers like John Locke, 1632-1704, Blaise Pascal, 1623-1662, Sir Isaac Newton, 1642-1727, J.J. Rousseau, 1712-1714, to 
1778, and others questioned the accepted beliefs and criticized the established social order. They wanted to replace the age of faith by the age of enlightenment. With the emergence of modern science, psychology and subjects allied to psychology also took a different turn. As Marsha Wiggins Frame puts it, the pioneers in psychology, Sigmund Freud, John B. Watson, Edward L. Thorndike, and B. F. Skinner, and others, aligned themselves with the scientific worldview, and as a result, gained credibility and respectability for their theories. That quote from Integrating Religion and Spirituality into Counseling, page 10, by Marsha Wiggins Frame. Freud believed strongly that religious indoctrination created a fear-induced repression that resulted in a reluctance to exercise critical thinking. He considered that rituals and liturgies in religion were instrumental in neurotic obsessions. Institutionalized religions with strict regimen have influenced those who are vulnerable adversely. Skinner, the behavioral therapist, said that people responded to reinforcements and religion was one of them. His major objection to religion is that much of the religious reinforcements are negative. He quotes the threat of hellfire, damnation, the possibility of being excommunicated from the church as examples. The note there from psychotherapy and atheistic values, a response to A. E. Bergen's Psychotherapy and Religious Values, the Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology, 48, page 635 to 639. Albert Ellis, who founded the Rational Emotive Therapy, went to the extent of saying that atheism was the only way to optimal human functioning because religiosity in many respects is equivalent to irrational thinking and emotional disturbance from the aforementioned book. Accordingly, psychological distress is the result of distorted thinking that one inherits by the socialization process of family, culture, and religion. Fear induced by repression, cruelty, and torture by the church in Europe might have led these eminent psychologists to come to negative conclusions on the role of religion on counseling and psychotherapy. But on the other hand, Buddhism in its long history never resorted to persecution in the name of religion. There are historical and textual evidence to show that it encouraged free inquiry and freedom of expression. The often quoted Kar Lama Sutta is a glaring example to this effect, and Guttara Nikaya, The Book of Ones, page 188, also Blueprint of Free Inquiry and Personal Verification by Venerable P. Jnana Rama. It is striking that in the Vimangsaka Sutta, the Buddha invites his disciples to put his teachings and him into an acid test before accepting him as their teacher. Note, the Mangsaka Sutta, Majjhimikaya 1, page 317, Upali Sutta, Majjhimikaya 1, page 137, expresses the same sentiment. Frame shows how Skinner's followers believed that all religious and spiritual beliefs are irrational distortions and why clients have to give them up. She gives six reasons for this lack of attention to religion and spirituality in counseling. The tenuous relationship between psychology and religion. The conflict between the assumptions of the scientific world and those of religion and spirituality. The association of religion and spirituality with pathology. The belief that religion and spirituality are the prerogative of the clergy and other spiritual leaders, a lack of training regarding how to integrate religion and spirituality into clinical practice. 
mental health practitioners own unresolved religious or spiritual issues. Frame adduces evidence across the decades for the positive aspect of religion and spirituality in psychotherapy. She gives the names of Frank Parsons, Jesse B. Davis, Carl Jung, Eric Erickson, William James, Gordon Allport, Abraham Maslow, and Viktor Frankl as worthy models for current clinicians to master ways of integrating spirituality into psychotherapy. That note from Integrating Religion and Spirituality into Counseling, page 9, from Marsha Wiggins' frame. And this concludes chapter 1. This is Bante van Rakita, also known as Brother Ben, uh, signing off. So I hope this has been of benefit to people. Uh, my intention here is to deepen people's understanding of the links between psychotherapy, counselling and the Buddhist teachings. I would like to repeat that the credit for this excellent work goes to Jenny Quick for her PhD thesis. I myself make no claims to be a highly qualified, licensed um, practitioner of any kind, a doctor of philosophy or psychology. I do have a diploma in Buddhist psychotherapy and counselling obtained in Singapore and I have experience of uh, around about 7,000 uh, meditation interviews gained in my early training in monkhood. So once again, I hope this has been benefit, and may many beings be free from avoidable suffering.